Uh, good, evening, good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, Main Tree's first first webinar, um, and it's uh, on our uh, Holt Research Forest. Um, a few logistical things uh, for uh, tonight. Um, on your screen, you probably see a couple of uh, uh, options to connect. I think there's a Q and A box, but there's also a chat box. Um, I would ask if uh, questions arise uh, during the presentation to either of Jack or of Barry um, or myself, although Jack and Barry are much more, more qualified, uh, go ahead and put those in the chat box. Um, so rather than answering questions as we go, um, the presentations will be about 35 to 40 minutes, uh, and then we'll take the rest of the time to uh, answer your questions, um, if that works for, works for folks. Um, we did get one question already uh, over uh, email. Uh, with respect to the impact of the uh, planned harvest on uh, the long-time research on vector-borne illness. And I've shared that with Barry and Jack already, and they'll likely be able to hit on that um, as they present, but certainly would welcome, uh, would welcome follow-ups. So my name's uh, Jonathan Labonte. Uh, I am the executive director uh, of uh, Maine TREE. Uh, TREE is an acronym for Timber Research and environmental education uh, and uh, excited to, to be with all of you tonight. Um, uh, the people you're here probably to hear more than me uh, present. Um, after me will be Jack Witham. Uh, Jack's a research scientist with the University of Maine. Uh, he'll provide an overview of the history of the Holt Forest development uh, as, as well as the research efforts that have been taking place for nearly four decades there. Uh, and Barry Brusela, who is a forester uh, with Mid Maine Forestry, uh, it's her, uh, her firm. Uh, she's also a board member of Maine Tree. Uh, we'll give some highlights uh, about the harvest plan uh, and be able to speak to some images of before and after harvest to um, walk through some of the logistics and what we can expect to see there um, out in the forest. Uh, we're fortunate, um, certainly, uh, at Maine Tree to uh, have had Jack as the, um, the lead researcher uh, at Holt for a significant period of time. Um, but where Jack is a, a staff member of the University of Maine, um, Maine Tree really believes it's important for us to build um, a relationship as well with community members, you know, both elected officials, um, appointed officials on committees like the Conservation Commission, as well as with residents. Um, so over the last couple of months, we've been um, building uh, on that outreach, uh, this webinar, and some highlights of not only the history of the whole forest, but also our upcoming timber harvest uh, is, is part, of, uh, part of that outreach and something that was uh, encouraged for us to enhance our outreach from the Board of Selectmen and Conservation Commission. So we uh, welcome them for, for, their, for their feedback. Um, our mission uh, at Main Tree uh, is threefold. It's education, it's research, and it's outreach, uh, and that's uh, statewide. Uh, but certainly the impact of Holt makes it uh, logical for us to be doing that work uh, in the community that the Holt Research Forest calls home. Um, this is not a webinar to uh, highlight um, in detail all of the programs uh, that are sponsored by Main Tree, um, but this slide gives you a sense uh, of the depth and breadth of those programs. Uh, we're probably uh, best known throughout the state for our sponsorship of Project Learning Tree, which is a standards-based curriculum uh, for pre-K through 12 that we've uh, sponsored in Maine for, uh, for over three decades. Um, and certainly uh, through this presentation at the end um, or in the future, if anyone here on the webinar uh, has interest in those programs um, for either involvement with us more broadly or specifically opportunities to connect some of these programs uh, to the community of Arousic, we are uh, open to do that and I'd welcome uh, that involvement. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jack. Uh, and Jack, I'll be here as your, your quarterback. So you just, you just say next slide and, and I will do it. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Um, Jonathan said I'm Jack Witham. I've uh, been here since the beginnings of the Holt Research Forest in uh, 1983. Um, so I, do have some perspective on the on the forest and some um, personal knowledge of what's going on here and hope to share some of that with you tonight. Um, there's a lot of information to cover, um, much more than can be covered in a simple uh, 20 minute, 25 minute presentation. Um, 
each of these topics could probably take 20 to 25 minutes or more in among them in of themselves um, so if i'm hurrying um, you'll understand why okay john so first a uh, little regional perspective um, you can see where holt research forest is located um, and you can see the surrounding communities and this gives a little perspective on how important uh, water is around us. Next. Uh, this is a little closer view. Um, this is a, a Google Earth image. Um, you can see the red outlining the boundaries of the whole property um, with the Back River on the east side, and Sewell Pond and Route 127 on the west. Next. Uh, photo from, from an airplane. Um, in the foreground is Spinney Mill Marsh and Sewell Pond, then Holt Forest. And behind Holt Forest is the Back River and then Flying Point, Falls Bay, um, Sassanoa River, uh, Westport Island. And then in the background is the, it is the Sheepskin River. That should give you some perspective. Okay. Uh, we can't talk about the history of Holt Research Forest without talking about Bill and Wendy Holt. Uh, this is showing them at their 50th wedding anniversary. Um, they began purchasing property in Arousic in the 1940s, um, accumulated a number of different properties until they had a contiguous 350 acre parcel, uh, actually it was 300 65 acres uh, before they gave about 15 acres to the town, um, which is now the Arousic Conservation Area. Next. The Holtz were summer residents here uh, for, for many years. And um, originally they lived in the property at the, the house at the north end of the property, which is now inhabited by the Harkin family. Um, they bought the property that later bought the property that included the old Methodist church. And that is now, um, they converted that into a summer residence and that has now been converted into a year round residence. And it's uh, on Old Stage Road. I'm sure many of you recognize that building. Okay. Um, what drew the Holtz here originally um, was the the Ipcar and Zorak families. Uh, Wendy apprenticed with William Zorak. Uh, the families became fast friends. And uh, you know, so it's Davlov Ipcar, William Zorak, who were the, were the primary well-known people of, the, of those two families, okay? We talk about the origins of the Holt Woodland Research Foundation. Um, that sort of spurned out of Bill Holt's interest in forestry, Rod Holt's interest in science, and um, Rod Holt, who was one of the original seven or eight people that started Apple Computer Corporation, um, was given um, a large number of Apple computer sh shares uh, when they went public. Um, he was needless to say he was a very wealthy man and he was primarily responsible for endowing the foundation and that endowment today still supports the work that goes on here okay so in uh, 1981 um, as when the first work began here at Holt Forest um, there was a natural resource inventory that was done by a team of scientists that resulted in 1983 with a proposal to the Holt Woodland Research Foundation from the School of College of Forest Resources, Matt Hunter and Al Kimball. And that uh, proposal was accepted and was the beginning of what we call a long-term study of an oak pine forest ecosystem. The original research goals were to, can you go back, Jonathan? Thanks monitor the long-term changes in the forest plant and animal populations and to document the effect of forest management on these populations. Next. That also came with some management goals. 
and these were to maximize the production of high quality timber, enhance wildlife diversity and abundance, and to maintain the forest aesthetic qualities. Okay. So with that, in 1983, um, they wanted to have a resident scientist here. So they decided that they were gonna build a log house to provide these accommodations. Okay. So the first task was to create a study area. The study area that we've been using since 1983 is the green that you can see on the east side of Old Stage Road. This is a, an area of about 40 hectares, about 100 acres. Um, the entire property is about 350 acres. So um, we're use, utilizing about a, a third of, of that area for the study. It's a largely intact forest. Um, had very little evidence of past harvesting. Forest was 60 to 80 years old when the project started. Um, there has, and uh, there has been some harvesting done since then. Um, the Holtz did very little except for establish some pine plantations in former agricultural areas and a little bit of uh, harvesting for firewood here and there, but that's very rare, okay? So the study area was divided into one hectare blocks. As you can see here, that is an area of 100 meters by 100 meters. Um, they were further subdivided into 50 by 50 meter quadrats, and then into 25 meter by 25 meter quadrats. You notice I'm talking meters here. This is not a typical US thing. Um, most foresters think do things in acres and inches and feet and they used to use change but not anymore um, so we we've based everything on on, a, on the metric system uh, because that is is the way of science the grid system is laid out very carefully um, all of the lines the block lines are all marked with painted trees on their sides um, there's rebar stakes and other uh, stakes in the ground at 50 meter intervals and we have tremendous ground resolution, so you're always within 25 meters of a known point. Okay. So in 1983, we brought together a team of top-notch scientists and students and began our research. Okay. So this is, I don't expect everybody to look at this list. This is way too much text, but just gives you an idea of the number of research projects that have been ongoing over the years. Some of these have been abandoned. Um, many of these occur at irregular intervals uh, and some of them occur every year. Okay. So when we started working here, one of the things that we really noticed um, was the uh, signs of past land use. And this has had a tremendous influence on what the land looks like today. And these are not atypical of things, typical scenes you would see in a Rausick with the presence of stone walls and fences, many of which follow old property lines, okay? But well, one result that we did, we did a lot of research on the um, origins of the whole property going back to 1720 when a Rausick was originally divided into lots. Um, some of these lines are still reflected from the 1720 map that was created by Keith. Some of these lines are still visible on the ground today, and many of them have stone walls on. On the aerial photo on the left-hand side, you can see the old property line. Until 1930s, the north property had still had sheep grazing on it. Um, on the south half of the property, we haven't found any evidence of pasture. Um, it, it was primarily a woodlot, we believe. Um, so the North Farm was originally owned by Colin, Collinwood Shea and the Holtz bought it from his heirs. The South Farm was owned by a Hogan's. Um, if you look in the, some of the cemeteries in Arousic, you'll see lots of Hogan's there. Um, the South Farm was also owned by a string of landowners who had things like portable sawmills, portable shingle mills, so that they were, um, that's more evidence to point out that it was used primarily as a woodlot. 
Okay. So after five years of research on many of the things you saw in that previous list, a harvest was conducted in the winter of 1987, 1988. The harvest occurred on 10 of the 40 hectares within the study area and in the yellow blocks that you can see outside of the study area. The red that you can see are the gaps, the canopy gaps that were created by the harvest. So within those, 40% uh, of the basal area was removed. Uh, basal area is a measurement that foresters use. It basically represents the uh, diameter of the tree and you compute the area of the tree from that measurement, you add up all of those trees and that gives you the basal area within a block. So basically it's the square footage of trees that occupy that block. So 40% of the total basal area was removed in, in the blocks within, within the study area. Um, the total volume in the harvest was 210 cords of firewood, 275 cords of softwood pulp, mostly pine, and 114,000 board feet of logs, again, mostly white pine, okay? So as a result of that, canopy gaps were created, the red that you saw in the previous slide. The opening size averaged six one hundredths of an acre in size. Those, that was the average of all the gaps that were created. Um, the smallest was a single tree removal, um, only 133 square feet. Um, the largest was about uh, eight tenths of an acre. Okay. Uh, the goal of the timber marking that was done before the harvest was looking at this primarily as a timber stand improvement with the removal of low quality trees. Um, a large percentage of the Volume that was removed was pine pulp, which is uh, fairly low quality pine trees. Um, and um, number three, logs, which are also fairly low quality logs. So it really was done to remove low quality trees to improve the conditions for better, um, higher quality tree growth. Uh, we wanted to create openings that were large enough to facilitate tree regeneration and third, to create greater vertical diversity within the forest and to change the forest from an even age to a multi-aged forest. Okay. So the tree regeneration that followed the harvesting, uh, we had good tree, regener tree regeneration from white pine, good natural regeneration. We have some great seed years and as a result, we had tons of pine seedlings coming into the property, into, the, into those gaps. We had red maple, uh, both from seeds, but primarily from um, stump sprouts that ar ar arose. And um, we did um, need to do some uh, timber stand improvement work because the red maples were so much dominating the um, response to the harvest that we wanted to remove those to give the pine and oak more chance to grow. Uh, so in 2001, we did a timber stand improvement to remove a lot of those red maple stump sprouts and increase the chances for pine and oak to regenerate. We did have some oak regeneration on, you see on the right, uh, but that was fairly limited. The deer had major impacts on our oak regeneration. Okay, so just to highlight here a little bit of the timber inventory data. This is just looking at uh, five hectares of harvested blocks where we have um, data up until 2007, uh, 27 years post-harvest. And you can see that um, there was quite a setback in the basal area immediately following the harvest, as you would expect, but there's been great growth and recovery by all species within those um, blocks. And I like to particularly highlight the red oak because the, the basal area of red oak is now greater than it was before the study took place. So we were quite successful in getting the red oak to respond to the harvest, okay? 
Uh, since, since the harvest, the deer numbers have been increasing. Um, they were both drawn in to the harvest uh, because of the abundance of food that are created. But um, in general, the deer populations in Southern Maine, um, Arousic and Georgetown have been increasing. And we've seen the impacts of that. As you look at these slides on the left, uh, hemlock browsing, um, an oak that has been heavily browsed to the point where it's dead. Um, also impacts on the herbaceous community on the right, lower, you can see where they've eaten off uh, the bracken fern. And uh, so they do have an impact there as well. One example, uh, just anecdotally, um, you used to walk in the whole forest and see hundreds of lady slippers on any given day. Um, today you walk through the forest and you see one, two, maybe three lady slippers on any given day. Next. So you can see that these, uh, the deer have had an impact on the tree regeneration. Um, here's an example of our 25 meter squared regeneration plots. Um, you can see the high numbers of uh, uh, stems. These are uh, number of stems per hectare. Uh, very high numbers um, for many of the hardwood species. And you can see that over the years in both harvest gaps and in ledge gaps, sorry, I lost some of my lettering there. Um, and the red arrows highlight the uh, red oak, which has seen the one of the most serious declines in um, regeneration within the forest and primarily due to deer. The brown, color, brown and darker green colors are the um, number of stems that have been impacted by deer browsing. And as you can see, um, they focus on um, red oak very early, later red maple, and then on to yellow birch, the least preferred species. Okay. Uh, I'll also look at our fruit production. Uh, we measured fruit production within the forest um, from 1996 to about 2006. Um, and this was done with numerous 25 by two meter wide strips where we would walk through and count the number of fruit. Next slide. Uh, just one example of this is the wild sarsaparilla. Um, this graph shows the number of fruit per plot, average number of fruit per plot. And you can see that um, the last fruit on these plots was seen in 1998. And this was because of uh, deer browsing and removal of the herbaceous forest community. Numerous other species went down to zero as well. Everything except for winterberry and some of the wet areas um, were down to zero. So we decided to abandon this study in, in 2006. Okay. So I'll switch on for a quick look at birds. Um, here you can see a pileated woodpecker and a veery and a black-throated green warbler. Our primary um, method for looking at birds has been territory mapping, where we literally take a map of the study area out into the woods with us, and mark the location of every bird that it is seen or heard. And this results in um, maps for each individual species that gives us exact locations of where they're occurring. I brought out two examples of some of the occurrence of these species. Uh, the two species that I'm going to highlight are oven birds and white-throated sparrows. And um, you can go to the next slide. So what you see here is the observations of oven birds in 1986. Um, all of the diagonally slashed areas are areas that we considered occupied by oven birds. And you can see that they focused in on the uh, intact forest canopy. Uh, you can see the red areas, the ledge gaps that they avoided. Um, in the background, you can see the cross hatching, which um, illustrates where the harvest gaps um, became after the harvest. Next. So this is in 1989, the first year post-harvest. And you can see that um, where the gaps are, the um, 
ovenbirds abandoned those areas and um, did not like the areas that did not have the intact forest canopy. Next. So white-throated sparrows, which are an early successional species, um, had a very different reaction. You can see that they did not occupy any of the intact canopy areas and they focused in on the open areas surrounding ledge gaps and, um, and that was their primary area of occupation. So you can see in the next slide, you can see that they immediately moved into those areas where the harvest gaps were created. They're an early successional species and they like those habitats, um, white-throated sparrows, common yellow throats, uh, rufous-sided, or sorry, eastern towhees um, were among the early successional species that showed up. Uh, another species that highlight uh, winter wrens in the first um, five years before the harvest, we had no winter wrens at all. In the year immediately after winter wren, uh, the harvest winter wrens showed up and we had five pair occupying the study area. So they respond very quickly to changes in the successional stage of the forest. And I'd add on to this that today, um, with the regrowth of the forest that um, white-throated sparrows have totally abandoned us again and um, the uh, oven birds are occupying almost all of the study area completely. So those are the changes that take place. Next. Uh, salamanders, uh, we, we look at redback salamanders. We have uh, artificial cover boards. We go out and lift up these cover boards several times a year. And you can see the population trends here. Uh, the blue and the green are comparing um, cut areas to uncut areas. And you can see that there were no significant differences between the cut areas and the uncut areas. And the redback salamander numbers have stayed relatively stable over that period of time. Okay. Uh, small mammal trapping. Um, we've been doing small mammal trapping at least once a year. Um, to date, we've registered over 30,000 total captures. On the left here, you see a white-footed mouse. Uh, this is a juvenile individual with a gray coat. And on the right is a red squirrel. So next, you can see this is a uh, number of individuals of white-footed mice. Um, you can see that their populations are up and down. Um, it very closely follows acorn numbers. Um, we are one of the first uh, studies in, in North America to document a, a cyclic population cycles like this. This is a regular three to four year cycle and it has not been documented at, at any other locations where white-footed mice occur in the U.S. Um, along with this, we've been also monitoring um, tick populations. Um, we've been working with the Maine Medical Center Insect Borne Disease Lab, um, collecting ticks, uh, looking at positivity rates and a number of other things, and uh, have witnessed the decline of several species of ticks and the, the large increase in black-legged or, or deer ticks. And um, we will continue to keep this going as, as we move forward as well. Okay. Uh, another group that we're looking at is flying squirrels. Um, you, what you'll notice in this graph is that uh, Northern flying squirrels are only present at the beginning of the study and they disappear uh, by 2003. Um, Southern flying squirrels move in and now the study area is only occupied by Southern flying squirrels. Now this is a, a change that's related to climate and climate change, um, the same uh, sort of change in populations has been documented in Ontario, um, where the southern flying squirrel has moved north 200 kilometers over the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, similar things are going on in Maine. 
um, a colleague at the University of Maine has been working on flying squirrels and she had to go all the way to Presque Isle to find northern flying squirrels. So I'm gonna switch now from the research. Uh, Jonathan talked briefly about the Maine Tree Foundation. Um, in 2014, um, the Hope Woodland Research Foundation merged with the Maine Tree Foundation. And, um, and it, was a, it was a change from, from management, of management of, of, the, um, of the property and of the research project. Um, but it, it's, it's been a positive change, I think. Uh, we now have an organization that's really paying attention to, to what's going on here. And I think the overall outcomes are going to lend itself to a very positive transition and uh, switch for Hope Research Forest. Okay, so one of the things that that has done um, is it's going to give us greater educational opportunities, which is an important part of our mission as University of Maine, as well as Maine Tree Foundation's mission. Um, the construction of this pavilion and a parking area given us the opportunity to have an undercover site for having programming so we can can do programs even if it rains. Um, the parking area has given us a safe off-road parking site. Um, I'm sure many of you who have lived in town for a while remember occasional Fridays and Saturdays when the Old Stage Road and Old Forest would be lined with cars other than the uh, swimming area and uh, for some of the seminars and, and educational events that we used to have here. Next. It's also given us an opportunity to host more um, children's activities here. For an example, uh, Georgetown School has been here a couple times to do work and research and have fun. Um, Celt Summer Camp, the Kennebec Estuary Land Trust has held a summer camp here. Um, they did two weeks in 2019. Um, the 2020 um, session unfortunately had to be canceled because of the COVID outbreak. But we hope to host Kelt here in the future and to do additional programming here through coordination with Project Learning Tree and other educational um, activities that Main Tree will be able to sponsor here. Okay. So we do um, hope to continue the Hope Forest tradition of outreach and education for natural resource professionals, landowners, and the general public talking about forest ecology, talking about forest harvesting, uh, talking about the response to forest harvesting, um, talking about the animals and plants that inhabit this area and other, other programs as well. So we'll continue that. Um, the University of Maine has also seen some changes. Uh, we have uh, Matt Hunter is no longer involved in the project. Uh, we're, we're now working under um, the um, Center for Research on Sustainable Forests within the School of Forest Resources. In uh, 2016, we received funding from the National Science Foundation to develop a strategic plan um, that is available on our website. Uh, we re-envisioned our mission and decided that we wanted to provide research, education, and guidance to ecologically and economically maintain and manage oak pine forest ecosystems. Next. So um, with some of the changes um, in recent years, there's been a lot of really high tech um, information that's become available, opportunities to collaborate. Um, in recent years, we've been working with the NASA Guided Space Flight Center uh, for doing their uh, LIDAR imagery. Um, you can see we had a graduate student working here with some of the data, and this is one of the 3D images that he created um, using the LIDAR imagery. Next. There's another image looking from above. Uh, down at the whole forest, you can see individual tree stems. Uh, this is very high resolution photography, which has actually enabled us to improve our ground truthing of, of tree locations. Okay, so this year we have an upcoming uh, 2020 
we will be conducting a harvest here. This is largely based on a 2017 forest and wildlife habitat management plan. And I think that, you know, what we're really gonna focus on here um, are looking at methods that we can um, fine tune forest harvesting to best meet today's current needs and the challenges faced by forest landowners, natural resource managers, forest industry, and it's particularly from a small non-industrial landowner's perspective. Uh, Barry's going to talk more about this harvesting, so I'll talk more about the um, some of the, the research and what we hope to get as outcomes from the research. Uh, two more maps of the study area. On the left, you can see uh, or barely see um, some of the blocks where we have recently conducted timber inventory work. Um, in the last two years, we've done complete timber inventories where we measure every tree over about four inches in diameter, um, record species diameter and conditions of the trees. And we've uh, done that work in 33 of the 40 hectares. And this is in preparation for looking at the impacts of the harvesting and looking at the regrowth post-harvest. On the right, you can see the cover types within the Holt Forest. And you'll notice uh, there are six, uh, three blocks of six hectares. Um, those are the areas where we hope to focus our research uh, more intensively. Um, and this is in within the oak pine uh, cover types that are within Holt Forest. Okay. Oh, post-harvest treatments. These slides have, have too much text. I'll just sort of highlight a few things. Um, we hope to be able to do a combination of prescribed burnings, scarification, deer exclosures, natural and artificial regeneration, um, all aimed at finding the most successful methods to achieve um, forest regeneration. We're particularly um, concerned about oak regeneration Throughout the range of oak in eastern North America, regeneration is a, is a significant problem. Um, down at the bottom, some of our, our loftier goals, you know, we hope to have outcomes that are, that are gonna help us gain knowledge, disperse information related to conservation of biological diversity, maintain the productive capacity of forest ecosystems, their health and vitality, uh, maintain and understand the forest contribution to global carbon cycles and maintain enhanced long-term multiple socioeconomic benefits. Okay, so, um, so we're going to be continuing our research in the next few years. We can continue many of the studies to supplement our pre-harvest data and complement our long-term data sets. Uh, we want to do careful monitoring of tree regeneration to allow for timely additional management to ensure desired outcomes. Uh, we closely measure the response within the herbaceous community, particularly interested in um, using deer exclosures um, where we can keep the deer out and see how the herbaceous community responds to that. We'll be looking at the bird response to the harvest. We're going to continue to monitor small mammal response to harvest, as well as their associated tick populations and their response to, to burning in particular. Um, and possibly we hope to increase monitoring with some wireless communication systems and more detailed instrumentation. Okay. So some of the outcomes that we're looking for, many of them related to climate change and the development of adaptation strategies. Um, we're looking to improve forest regeneration and growth. Um, look at the bird response to harvesting. Um, look at the outcomes on small mammals, vector-borne diseases, deer impacts on understory vegetation and tree regeneration. And uh, something that we think we will have to contend to that we haven't had to very much in the past is uh, invasive species. So we'll be wa watching that very closely as well. And I'll close there and turn it over to Barry. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Jack. The floor is yours, Barry. Okay. Hey. Hey.
Very good. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, Jack did a very thorough review of the research that's been done over the years on the whole forest. And research is definitely a big part of what's going on there, but part of our mission also is demonstration forestry and demonstration of good land stewardship. And there hasn't, as Jack mentioned, there was only some harvesting that was done back in the 1980s, and that was about 30 acres on a 300 and something acre of property. So the amount of harvesting that's been done on the property in the recent past is really quite minimal. And the goal of our harvesting that we're about to do is uh, multiple goals, and Jack did touch on some of those. Uh, basically, the goal of the harvesting is to encourage the growth of a forest that's resilient in these times of climate change, trying to encourage a forest which has a mix, mix of species and tree sizes and tree ages. So if something comes along which really impacts one part of the forest, you don't have a monoculture and other parts will be able to take over. So to me, a healthy forest is one that's resilient, has kind of keeping all the pieces and um, being able to, to go into the future that way. And the harvesting that we'll be doing is something that small landowners and other landowners in the area and in the landscape area that have oak and pine forests will be able to learn from the research that's been done on this forest and learn the in, what are the impacts of the forest of the harvesting going to be in the forest in the future and how does that affect land management for other people in the area. So it's demonstration forestry in that sense. And um, the data that we've had to date is going to be really useful in going forward in the, in the future. And I know a lot of people have concerns about timber harvesting, afraid of what's going to happen, or about, afraid of what it's going to look like. These pictures I took from the, the Maine Forest Service has a great new publication called um, What Will My Woods Look Like? Because that's really a concern of a lot of people when they think about timber harvesting. So if you go to the Maine Forest Service website, um, they have a lot of good stuff there. But if you just look up what will my woods look like, it'll bring you right to this new publication. And I just used some of the pictures from there. And these are this um, these slides on the screen now with what's called a thinning and crown relief. And you can see the picture on the left is a uh, four picture. And you can see the trees are overcrowded. Um, there's a certain amount of mortality. And then the picture on the right shows a dur during the harvest uh, operation. There's a, a mechanized uh, feller buncher, which is cutting the tree. And on this particular harvest that we're going to do, be doing at the Holt, the loggers who are doing it are two brothers, Don and Will Cole. Their business is called Trees Limited. Will is actually on the board of directors of the Main Tree Foundation as well. Their business is um, one of the most respected logging businesses in the state. And they will be having a mechanized operation, uh, a cut the length system, and also a chipping operation that will be going on. So it will be a lot of big, scary machinery, but they're very good at what they do. And to me, what's most important is not the size of the machinery, but the skill and attitude of the logger and being adaptive adaptable to ground conditions and that sort of thing. So that's what really makes a good job rather than the size of the equipment. Okay, so next slide please, Jonathan. And these are some after pictures. This, these pictures are actually taking on, taken on a woodlot in Milford, but it's kind of similar to what will be happening on parts of the whole research forest. You can see the picture on the left is immediately after the harvest. You can see there's uh, slash on the ground, you can see some new trees starting to grow up, and then the picture on the right is five years later, and you can see the difference in the regeneration of the pine there. So the forest evolves. It looks different every year after a harvest, and some people are upset by the sight of slash on the ground, um, opening the trails and that sort of thing, but the slash is actually good. It, it will rot back into the soil, um, and provide nutrients to the soil. The, the branch, the woody material will provide habitat for and hiding places for small mammals. Um, the openings will create some more sunlight for more regeneration to grow and hopefully get some more of the 
herbaceous layer to grow again. Yeah, that was the uh, information that Jack gave about the disappearance of so many of the plants, especially something that I think of as so common as the star saccharella. To see that in decline is um, kind of discouraging. So anyway, these are this is these slides we've seen are kind of the progression of what one harvest would look like. Okay, the next slide, please, Jonathan. And this is a different area. This is these uh, slides named Forest Service uh, calls an improvement harvest. And this will be similar to other parts of the harvest on the Holt Research Forest. You can see the area on the left is really quite overcrowded and has also a certain amount of mortality. And then the picture on the right shows where it's been thinned down. And basically, in an improvement thinning like this, you're looking at the best trees and leaving them and thinking about how can you help them out by the harvest? How can you release their tops for further growth? How can you open them up for some more regeneration? So that's, uh, that's I'm just trying to show these pictures so you can visualize it. And I would also encourage people to come to the tour on Saturday if you're at all able to because it's so much better than looking at things on a screen. And we will be holding a tour during the harvest at some point too, when the machines are actually there and the loggers are there. So you'll be able to see in action what's going on. And we haven't set a date for yet, that yet, but um, there will be a date. And the harvest will basically be in the east side of the property um, between the old stage road and the river. And we, the whole area there is about 183 acres. And about 30% of that acreage is not going to be harvested because we're not going to harvest anything in the shoreland zone or within 50 feet of the road. Um, there's some wetlands we're not going to be harvesting in. So there will be definitely parts of the forest that will be a reserve, parts of the area within the actual research area we are going to be left uncut as well. So Jack will be able to have comparative data for harvested and non-harvested areas. So I see we're getting kind of, okay, we've got some more slides here, thank you. Um, these are some more um, before and after pictures, thank you, Jonathan, of um, some improvement thinning. And again, you can see the brush on the right, and to me, that looks good. It's, again, it's pushing the soil, putting nutrients back into the soil. So is that the last slide, Jonathan? Okay, one more. This is looking up into the canopy. <clears throat> the before picture is on the left, and the after picture is on the right. So making some small gaps in the canopy is a good thing. It brings sunlight down to the forest floor, which is en encourages regeneration and growth of the herbaceous layer. <clears throat> and oak especially needs a certain amount of sunlight in order to regenerate. So. This is, again, just to give you kind of an idea of what it might look like before and after a harvest. I believe that's the last slide, Jonathan. Yes, I'd like to open it up to questions. People probably have a lot of questions about the harvesting, so I can maybe answer those or Jack can answer those. 